glad to be able to speak to you about the work in India, the work that you have supported for several years now. I want to tell you a little bit about the plans for the work. Jack Honeycutt is the current coordinator of the work. He's been doing it for about 23 years. The elders at the Willett Church of Christ in Willett, Tennessee have overseen the work. And so a transition is going to be made. Jack's going to, he's chosen to, to step aside from the work. He's done it for a long time. He says, I'm ready to, to stop traveling so much. And so they sought a replacement. And so there's been plans for a little while to, to find someone to replace. So that's when the transition period right now. Unfortunately, because of COVID and, and schooling and other things, we've not been able to make a trip to India in quite a while. So we had plans to go in at the 1st of June. Well, that was postponed September. That's been postponed. And right now, the plans are January 6th through the 21st. But we'll see the situation in India is not very good for as far as the COVID goes. They don't have the resources like we have here in the plan that we have. There's a lot more people there, too. So the likelihood of it being spread is, is a lot higher. I will live in Tennessee, and we will make a trip, Lord willing, once a year, a three-week trip. In years past, men would go for six weeks at a time and stay in India, and that became more and more difficult with the government, and it's also very difficult to find men who can be gone for six weeks to stay in India. So um, trips have been made in November, sometimes twice a year, but because of the government, because of the brethren and their suggestion, the, the number of individuals going and the frequency of the trips have cut down over the years. Now we have to go over as tourists. And of course, you never declare you're going over for religious reasons. But now the Indian Brethren and the Americans both plan tourist visits so that we can honestly say we are there to be tourists. But our main purpose is to go and to spread the gospel and to check up on the work. And that's what I want to share with you is information about the work. Every year we have a theme. And this year, the theme, the January trip of 2020 of this year is unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is not a picture that was found on Google. This is a picture taken by one of the team members. And you'll see the monkeys at the bottom eating the apple. The brethren had told the Americans, those are going back to the villages. It says, oh, it's only about two kilometers, which isn't very far of a trip, but it ended up being about six miles. So six mile trip. And it comes a long trip when you expected it to be a lot less than that. So along the way, the apple there given to the monkeys and you see the, the scenery down through there, but that's the trail. I want to share a lot with you about the work and thankful to be able to share the slides. This is what the area looks like in India where the work's taking place. You see the picture, it's farmland and the mountains and behind the bottom right corner You'll see Jack Honeycutt, who is the current coordinator of the work. And they were going back in some of the villages and the Indian brethren had insisted, we're going to put you on horses. We're going to, we're going to ride horseback. And so when they got there, their expectations were some large horse like we would see here, but it was a small pony. And then they told them, brother, this horse has never been ridden before. So not only is the horse much smaller, the horse had never been ridden by someone before. So they put a burlap sack across the horse and they tried riding the horses. My father was on this trip, and I don't have the video in the presentation. You know how well that would go. And my father knew I was sharing it, but he tried to get on the horse, and he fell off the other side. But he was okay, and the horse was okay. They ended up walking most of the trip. To give you an idea about the population, the size of India, and the need for work in India is because it is the second largest country in the world, and this data from 2017 so second only to China. And if these circles represented all of the countries, notice where the United States is. It's quite small compared to China and India. And brethren are trying to do work in China, but it's very, very difficult there. And India, at least, is not as difficult. And there are good brethren in India and, and many who want to help and try to do the work in India. Another example of population size and the difference in the countries, you'll notice... China is at 18.5%, India 179 and look, what's third? The United States of 4.3%. And something that's been said, and I'll share it now, is where is most of the preaching in the Lord's Church done? Where are most of the preachers? 
They're in the United States. They're in the United States. So you see the need to work in countries like India, China, Indonesia, Brazil, and other places. But most of the preaching is done in the United States. And that's why we work in India. And that's why there's an important need there because there are many, many people in the hear the gospel all over, not just here, but abroad. Where does the work take place in India? Uh, you'll see in the red color there, it is in the state of Andhra Pradesh, along the coast, the, the Bay of Bengal. So most of the work is done not along the coast, but inland in the mountain areas, in the villages. Not much preaching is done in the cities, because the people in the cities are really no different than in the United States, unfortunately. The people in the cities are not as receptive of the gospel. In India, they have the caste system. So you have the high caste has very little involvement with the low caste and vice versa. And so it's very difficult to speak to the high caste people. So most of the work is done in the villages where the people will listen and where they come and travel for miles and for hours upon end to come and listen to the gospel. The projected population of this state is 54 million people. 54 million people in an area of 63,000 square miles. So a lot of people fitting in one state in one small area. The language they speak there is Telugu. It is the low caste language. If you if you run into an Indian family here in the state, someone may be working in a in a store, or you meet them or your neighbors and you talk to them and ask them, "Do you speak Telugu?" and they would probably look at you funny because they are the high caste system. The poor people who live in the villages, those who don't have the means, speak a language, and you can imagine how that would divide a country. Or not only were they divided because of the caste system, because of their economic status, but also because of language. And so we have great brethren there in India who speak very fluent English and also speak Telugu and are able to translate. And so the gospel is able to be spread. The location of the work, farmland and remote villages. A lot of travel. The video may be playing, sometimes the video plays, sometimes it doesn't, but you'll see, it, see a still image. That is my father, Glenn Holmes. He's traveled to India since 2002 multiple times. To give you an idea about how much traveling, this does not take into account the traveling and the flights to India. This is simply in the country of India, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, 5,900 miles traveled by the group that went in January of 2020. And this gives you an idea of where are they going. They're going out in the villages and they're not riding a car, an air-conditioned vehicle into a nice air-conditioned building. There's nothing wrong with those things. They're going out into the villages. And, and so they're going out and helping people that maybe have never heard of Jesus or heard of God and teaching the gospel to them. So see the man on the left, of course my father and some other individuals along the path. This man in the back has his sandals on on a bamboo stick. And so he was asked, Brother, why, why don't you throw the shoes away? They're broken. He says, I cannot throw the shoes away. I'll, I will repair them. He says, they're the only shoes that I have. And so when this story was shared in one of the congregations in Tennessee that supports the work, a lady said, I'm not going to let that man go without shoes. So she gave some money for shoes. And so he has several pairs of shoes now. He's a preacher there. That gives you an idea of what the preachers and what the life was like there. He has one pair of shoes and he could not afford to throw them away. But fortunately now he has other shoes. You'll see some of the pictures down below what a makeshift meeting place looks like on the building. The picture up in the top left of the tent there and brother meeting there. You'll see on the top right the pathway. I know the picture is a little bit smaller. You'll notice the picture down to the bottom left, the two individuals there, the man translating, and then Jack Cunnicutt preaching there in the blue shirt. And they got back to this village and went very far back into the village. And there were only seven individuals who had come to listen to the gospel. And the Indian brethren were trying to apologize to the Americans. We're sorry. We're sorry. There are only seven. He said, there's no reason to apologize. If one soul back in the village was, was willing to listen to the gospel preached for the first time and to hear the message of Jesus Christ and of God and of salvation, then it was worth the trip. And so you'll see those individuals sitting there. And then you'll notice a building there in the bottom right corner, and there are a few more individuals there. One of the elders that will at the overseeing congregation is there, and he is preaching the use of a translator to some individuals there. And so those, uh, we would call them a hut, 
and those can be built for the Indians to build, have a place, some shelter over their head, and they can stay dry during the rain. There again, some of those pictures in greater detail. In one village, they traveled to, they were preaching the gospel, and notice in the top right-hand corner, there is a very elderly lady. She is 91 years old, and she had walked about two miles to hear the gospel preached at 91 years old and was baptized that day. In the bottom right-hand corner, you may be able to see, and in the middle picture, there is a tank there, a water tank. And so they did not have a baptistry, so some men grabbed some shovels and dug out a hole and allowed some of the water to come from the tank so that they may be able to baptize people in the water there. We have nice baptistries here. We have means to baptize people in pools and bathtubs. And so there, sometimes the only baptistry you have is the one that you can dig out of the ground and to put the water there. And so someone who is willing to submit to Jesus Christ doesn't question the water. They're willing to be obedient and to be baptized. And thanks be to God that there are people who are willing to help them in that. In the mountainous region, over the years, the missionaries have not been able to go. The Indians have not been able to go and to teach the gospel to those in the mountainous area and those remote villages because of the communist influence. There was a terrorist group called the Knox Lights. Fortunately, the Indian police have gone through and killed off many of those terrorists, have driven them out of the region. But some of the remnants remained reminding of the communist influence. China had supported some of these terrorist groups. They had tried to have an impact in India for a long time, but those groups have been removed, so doors have been opened. Thanks be to God that now Indian brethren and American brethren can go into these places, but there are still reminders in the area of the former communist influence and the lack of ability to be able to go and to teach the gospel in those areas because it was so dangerous. Some of the numbers in 2019... 82 villages were preached in. In 2020, this past January, of that three-week time, 103 villages were preached in. Um, men used to go one at a time with Indian translator, and because of safety concerns, the Indian brethren and the elders here in the States have decided that men would go two by two. So there'd be two American preachers would go with some Indian brethren and translators. And so you may be able to see on the picture on the right, there's the path. And there's some of the, the American brethren, and Indian brethren, that are going back into the villages to preach. Total baptisms for the campaign in 2019 were 628, and in 2020, 706. And those numbers may seem quite astounding for a three-week period that 706 people would be baptized into Christ. And I guess if I saw those numbers and didn't know the backstory, I would be very concerned that people were only being dumped in water and that it was all about the numbers. But that is not the case in India. The Indian brethren have worked and worked and worked with individuals in the village. And when the Americans are there, when the Indian brethren have been working and studying with them, it harkens back maybe to days here in the States in the 40s and 50s where a large number of people were hearing the gospel preached by a visiting preacher and maybe a hundred were baptized. Maybe a large amount were baptized. And in, and in our history, when we think back to those days and hear those stories, it, it, it's, it's a, great, a great thing to hear. It doesn't surprise us. Now it's very surprising. If we had five being baptized in a six-month period, we would be rejoicing. To hear of 706 baptisms in a three-week period over a, an area of 63,000 miles, square miles, those numbers are great numbers. Research has been done by the overseeing congregation of Willett and Jack Honeycutt for a 20-year period. And the statistics are very sure that 80 to 85% of the individuals who are converted to Christ, baptized into Jesus Christ, remain faithful. 80 to 85%. And as a young person hearing preachers bring up statistics about, about young people and, and Christians here, the numbers are always told to us that 80 to 85% of young people would leave the church. And from experience and thinking about those I've grown up with, and I'm sure you can think of individuals here, some people move away. They get married or they go to school and they move away and they worship somewhere else. But we lose numbers of people here in astounding rates. And in India, they are gaining souls. 
Souls are being added by God to the church in astounding rates. And it is not because they're simply dunking people underwater. People, poor people, hearing the gospel, hearing about Jesus Christ for the first time. And imagine what that must be like to hear that there is something sure, there is something concrete, there's something solid they can put their faith in. It's not a multitude, millions of gods. It is one God and his son who was willing to die on the cross for all people, not just high caste people, but low caste people, poor people, rich people all over the world. New congregations that are started 12 in 2019 and 50 and 15 in 2020. Here is a picture of the group who, that went in January of 2020. Uh, on the far left is a preacher, Ralph Richardson, from one of the congregations in Tennessee that supports the work. On the far right, you'll notice the man in the yellow shirt there. That's one of the elders from the congregation that traveled. There's a man standing in the back, of, right behind him in the plaid shirt. He's from Michigan. The young man in the white shirt in the middle is one of the associate ministers of the Willett Congregation, a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. He was a year ahead of me in school, Hatton Allen. So he went to India for the first time. Standing in the middle right below him in the blue shirt is Jack Honeycutt, the current coordinator of the work. And to the left and right of him, very, very sound Indian brethren, also translators, educated men. Um, almost all of the brethren we work with have master's degrees, some doctorate degrees in English, and they're very educated men, very, very devoted to the work. One of the elders of Willett Congregation, the bottom left in the blue shirt and glasses, and then behind him, my father. And then John Ratnam is the man standing in the back row, the Indian brother. His father, B. Ratnam, was converted by J.C. Bailey back in the 1960s. J.C. Bailey was a Canadian. He was able to get into the country when people from the United States could not. And so J.C. Bailey was able to go into the country and to preach the gospel. And B. Ratnam, the father of John Ratnam, was one of the first individuals to be converted. And then brothers Ira Rice and others were able to go into the country and so there's work all over India. I talk to people all the time and they say, well, do you know so-and-so? And I said, do you remember? There are over a billion people in India. And so there are Christians everywhere that we may not know about or may not be familiar with. And then just in this one state of Andhra Pradesh, that shows the name of earlier, is where this work is taking place. Each year, or they try to each year, have a lectureship where they invite all the preachers in from, from all over, and it is a two-and-a-half-day two lectureship. This past year in January, they held the lectureship, and there were 1,600 in attendance. So these are preachers, some who are married, some of their wives may come, their children. In times past, they've had women's classes. My mother and Jack Honeycutt's wife, Becky Honeycutt, have gone over and taught some of the women's classes in a separate area. This year, there were the, the, the American Brethren, the Indian Brethren, and 1,600 in attendance. It's very expensive to be able to have all these preachers come in. But thanks be to God that there are individuals who, who want to support this work and to make sure that this happens. We enjoy lectureships here. And it's easy for us because we may only travel 25 minutes and we could be at a lectureship or a gospel meeting. But there, this is a big deal for them because many of these men are traveling by bicycle or walking for hours at a time to be able to come to this. So they feed them, they stay, they sleep on the floor here at the building, and then they have a lectureship. They have such classes for men who are elders to try to talk about the leadership in the church. They have men who are former denominational preachers, and we'll talk a little bit about that and the training that they go through, but there are all kinds of classes that are taught to try to encourage the brethren there. Just as we love lectureships and gospel meetings here, they do there also. One of the schools of preaching, um, there is the Tuni School of Preaching. This is located in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And when the Americans were there this past time, there was a graduation ceremony. And so they took part in the graduation ceremony. And someone has asked, why do the students have different robes than the instructors and the American brethren? And they said, brother, because it is cheaper to rent a different color. And so the students were honored to be able to wear the same color to wear black and the Americans and we're able to wear red and orange because it's cheaper to rent those. So the students are honored in that, and that's why there's a difference. But there are nine graduates of the school. And that sounds very much like some of the schools here in the States. They go through a two-year program, thanks to the Bear Valley 
school that able to use the materials to work with the students over there. And so there's the, some pictures and some information about the Tooney School of Preaching. The Herald School of Biblical Studies is a school that's set up to help work with the denominational preachers that are converted to Christ. They don't just convert a denominational preacher and then send him out to preach. They want to educate him. So for one week out of every month, for 12 months, so 12 weeks total spread out over a year, these men are brought in and they are, they learn in this school, in the Herald School of Biblical Studies. So they're educating men who are former denominational preachers, making sure they understand the truth of the gospel and that, that what they're going to preach is the truth and that it strengthens them and encourages them so that they're not drawn back into denominationalism. Some of the pictures you see a picture of the classroom there with the tables and chairs. So individuals come in and sit into sit in the classroom and receive proper education. There are 28 denominational preachers converted through the work of the Indian Brethren and work that's supported by individuals and congregations here. You see a picture of a man up at the top standing in front of the church building. He was a former Pentecostal preacher. And so when he learned of the truth, he went back to the place where he was preaching and was able to convert 10 souls. Now the remainder of the individuals did not like what he was doing and kicked him out. And so you'll see at the bottom right hand corner, some of those individuals who were converted to Christ and left Pentecostalism. Denominationalism is... It is a problem, what we would say in our American denomination, Baptist, uh, Pentecostalism. So, um, so there's, they face the same um, problems over there that we face in trying to convert people in the era that they believe. But the major religion there is Hinduism. And so many Hindus are converted to Christ also. There's a, a better picture. The individual on the left was the Pentecostal preacher who was converted. And then one of the the... Church of Christ preachers there on the right was able to baptize that man. Where does the financial support go? This is a question that's asked a lot of times, and we always want to be very clear and transparent when we talk about the India work. There's nothing hidden. There's no fine print. 100% of the funds that are given by congregations and by individuals for the India work goes to the India work. There's no salaries. There's no overhead. There's no supplies. They're not paying for flights. None of that. All of the money that is given by Riverside, by individuals and congregations throughout the United States, 100% of the funds go to India and to the work in which the individuals and congregations choose to support. The following slides are going to show where some of that money goes. Here's a church building that's being built. Church buildings cost $8,000. And you'll notice that it's a block mortar. It has a tin roof on it. It offers a secure place. For individuals to meet we understand that we also understand that it is a beacon for the people in the village and in that area so that they see the building you'll notice the pa system the speaker there sitting on the chair there's one on the far side a pa system can be purchased for three hundred dollars they don't put them on the inside of the building they put them on the outside of the building and many times when um, there's a worship service going on or a meeting going on and the gospel is being taught Individuals are coming by with their animals or they're traveling to go to the market and they hear the gospel and they're drawn in. If we did that here in the States, we would probably have the police called on us because we would be disturbing the peace. But in India, they put those PA systems on the outside of the building so that people hear the gospel. They can't help but hear it when they go by. One of the criteria for, for a congregation that they want a building is because of the demand and because of the cost of the building, if a congregation wants a building, they must provide the land themselves, either by donation or because they bought the land or someone in the congregation is willing to give the land. They also have to be a congregation of 50 or more. The concern is that it will be a smaller congregation. The building will be built. So much money and attention would be given to this that there wouldn't be enough people who wouldn't sustain and it would go into the hands of the government or to the nomination. So the criteria is they must own their own land. They must have at least 50 members. And there must be a sound, well-established congregation. They use one individual to build the building, so it helps keep the cost down. I know I heard from someone the other day about building buildings in Africa, and it was very expensive because not only did you have to have the material and to pay someone to build the building, but you also had to buy the land. And so situations are a little bit different in India. 
Here's a picture of the of children and adults outside of the congregation. I know it's difficult to see, but on the back you'll see a plaque that has some information. And each congregation or each church building that is built that's supported by an individual congregation in the United States, then there's a plaque that goes on the outside of that building to recognize who who helps support that. And so the recognition. The Indians are very big about recognizing. That's one of the things that surprises the American brethren when they go over. The Indian brethren want to laud them with, with lays and they want to, to stand and they want to give them a lot of praise. And it is a cultural thing. It is not a religious thing. It is a cultural thing. And so it's very important for the Indian brethren that, that, that preachers, that gospel preachers and Christians are recognized when they come to visit. You'll notice the women wearing the very colorful dresses. They call those saris. And the children there are very colorful and it helps bring a smile to your face when you see the picture of the individuals there who want to hear the gospel, who are Christians or are being taught the truth. And not only are their colors, their, their clothes colorful, but their faces are colorful because they have heard the same gospel that you and I have heard and many have become obedient to the same truth that we've become obedient to. And you'll see a picture there in the top left-hand corner of the PA systems that were purchased and given to the preachers so they may carry those back. They look a little bit different than the PA systems and the other pictures, but these, they're able to be carried by the preachers to wherever they're going to preach. And then you'll notice the bicycles at the bottom are given. A bicycle can be purchased for $100. This is very important for the Indian brethren because they have no vehicles, and many of them preach in two or three congregations each Lord's Day. So they are traveling on these bicycles, and it helps to get them there faster so that they're able to preach as, to as many congregations as possible. Something I know you'd be very interested in is to know about the orphans. There are, now there are 450 orphans in nine homes. The numbers have fluctuated over the years. Many of them have grown older and they are married and they are gone from the homes. Um, some things change and so and when there's an opportunity, children are brought into the homes. Not all of these children are are orphans in the sense that both their parents are dead. But sometimes the situation is so severe in India that one or both parents cannot take care of the child, and so they're brought into the home. These orphans' homes are completely ran by Christians. They are not by the state. They are not by denominational individuals. They are ran by Christians. And you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner that there are 325 widows in eight homes. In the system in India, when a woman's husband passes away, the culture says that she may not remarry. The Bible says, and the Bible's been taught, and the brethren over there have been, have been shown the scriptures, that it is okay for a man or a woman to remarry, but their culture says that it is not okay. So these women have no means of supporting themselves. It is not easy for a woman to go and find employment as it would be here in the States. So the widow's homes are very important for these women, Christian women. They don't go and just receive a place to live and food and do nothing. They have jobs. They take care of the children. They sew. They are hard workers. They are not on a what, what we might say a welfare, welfare system where they're simply just taken care of. The children are educated. They're given a Bible education. And the great thing about these children is many of them by the age of 14 have chosen to become Christians. The way marriages work in India, you may be familiar with, is there are arranged marriages. And so what they do is they may pair up a boy and a girl to be married from different homes, not from the same home, but they choose to pair them with someone from a different home. So you have a child who is taught the gospel, who is educated, who is brought up with a Christian background. They're taught the gospel. Many of them choose to become Christians. And then when they're old enough, their arranged marriage with another Christian. And so you see the benefit of that. Supporting an orphan, an orphan's home, a widow or widow's home is the fact that they're all ran by Christians. The children are taught the Bible and many become Christians and marry Christians. Wouldn't that be nice in the United States if the same thing was happening, that all our children were growing up becoming Christians and marrying Christians. That's why we need to put a very, very strong effort into teaching our children and influencing our children to become a Christian and to desire to marry a Christian. Here's a picture of two women who were former prostitutes. 
their husbands had either died or were no longer in the picture and these women resorted to prostitution to be able to try to support their families. They were converted to Christ, brought out of that sin, their sins washed away, and a means to help them is to provide them with a sewing machine. On this night, there were several women that were given sewing machines. Sewing machines cost $100. The women are given the supplies in the sewing machine. They're able to support themselves by making clothes. So no longer do these women have to resort to prostitution as a means. They can support their children through work in the sewing machine. So there's a picture of my father. He is an elder at the West Huntsville Congregation in Huntsville, Alabama. And a woman there from the congregation had given money to buy sewing machines for these ladies. And so on that night, they gave the sewing machines to them. Some of the goals for this year in 2020, um, of course, circumstances are not as they have been in the past, but the work is still going on. The brethren over there are still trying to teach the gospel. The situation is there as such where the government is not allowing them to go out. In some instances, individuals, not necessarily Christians, are beaten for leaving their homes. You can imagine many of the people in the villages who are poor rely on working in the fields, working with the livestock. They're not able to do that. And so very much help has been needed to, to go towards food and providing the Christians with food there. But our goals, we always have goals each year. The goal this year is to purchase $100,000 worth of Bibles. Bibles can be purchased, complete Bibles. Of course, they must be in the Telugu language, but New Testaments can be bought and full Old Testament and New Testament both. And in every village they go to, every year they realize we need more Bibles, we need more Bibles. And so many individuals will who go over the American campaign will purchase Bibles. I believe New Testaments are, are fairly cheap, maybe $10. I don't quite remember the exact number on that. But New Testaments can be purchased. Bibles can be purchased. They're in the language of the people. And so they're given out to people and they desire something that, that people here in the States, we can't even imagine. The people are pleading and begging for Bibles, for New Testaments and for complete Bibles, Old and New Testaments. So that's one of the goals. Printing, $50,000 in printing. The good thing about printing is that the Willett congregation, the supporting congregation, has purchased a printing press a few years ago. And so Christians own the printing press they run the printing press, and so when funds are made available, then materials are printed. Apologetics Press, um, GBN, the Bear Valley, there are many, many people who have given permission to print materials for the Indian brethren in the language of Telugu, and so that's done when funds are made available. Church buildings, 20, the goal for this year is 20 church buildings, that's $8,000. There are congregations that have said, well, we can't we can't provide 8000 so we'll give some money to go towards church buildings. We've been able to travel to several congregations to give a report, and so far we have been given funds for five, maybe six church buildings at this point for 2020, and that's, that's excellent because that means that, as we mentioned earlier, there is a place for Christians to be able to convene. It is a beacon for that community to see that building, to hear through the PA system, and so there's a safe place for them to worship that will last a long time. Bicycles, the goal is 100 bicycles, and they're $100 each. So that's the goal for this year, for those preachers to be able to travel. And then PA systems, the goal is, is 50 PA systems. So that's, that's some of the goals for this year. Orphans, to support an orphan, which you may be familiar with because you support orphans, is to support an orphan is $25. That's for food and clothing and for their education. For widows, it is $10 for a widow because it is for their food. And so they, obviously, as widows and mentioned earlier, they help support and, and teach the children and take care of the children, but they're also doing things like sewing. So they have a means of income. It's just they need help with food. So there's $10 for food. To support a preacher in India, it is $50. And that's going to help support him and his family. And of course, he may or may not have a bicycle. For a PA system, we mentioned earlier, that's $300. Bicycles, $100. A sewing machine, $100 to help a widow, help a woman who's trying to support her children. Bibles are $5 each. I believe that's for the New Testament. And then, of course, the church building is $8,000. We appreciate your support. I'm very glad to be able to, to be able to present to you about the work so that you can hear it firsthand and to see 
images and to know what's going on over there. And I appreciate the elders here at Riverside for us continue to support that work. If you have any questions about the work, about some of the things that were talked about, or maybe some things that I didn't talk about, please reach out to one of the elders or to Cody and to let them know your question. And they can submit that question to me and send it on. If I don't know the answer, I'll ask people who do know the answer, and I'd love to be able to answer your questions and help give you any, any information about the work that you support or other works that are supported so that you might have an adequate knowledge of what's going on. We appreciate your support. We're very thankful for what you do in helping spread the gospel in the country of India, and I hope and look forward to being able to speak to you about the work in years to come.